Money loves speed and I like running marathons. Do you think the kind of opportunity in the online space is closing out? The main thing for me has always been I have the immigrant mindset. We only have one choice and we need to go for it. Whatever we spot, we need to run towards it. I'm a creative first, entrepreneur second. So I've always wanted to grow an audience regardless of the outcome, whether it was monetizing or even the agency. I was growing my audience just for fun clients came as a result of the fun that I was having. Before we start this video, I have one small favor to ask of you. If you've been enjoying the US tour so far and all the effort we put into making these videos as best as possible for you, please hit the subscribe button down below so we can help more people every single week. Thank you. All right, where I want to start. Um, do you think the kind of opportunity in the online space is closing out? No, it's only just starting. Hmm, interesting. Why do you think that? I think like all good things come to an end. So if there's something that's propelling forward, whether it's a dot-com bubble, whether it's a crypto bubble, whether it's, I don't know, like the market going up and up and up to 2008, whether it's real estate, it's great when you're in it. And it's like, you think the party's never going to end, but then there comes a point whereby there's a correction. Like every push and pull has a, every pull in the world has a equal and opposite push. Okay, it's like dynamics of physics Gravity. and shit, right? <laughs> but so for everything that there's moving forward, there's an equal and opposite pull, right? It's a polarity. It's like masculine and feminine. There's always like an equal and opposite effect. So everything is moving forward like more and more to online. Online business is almost getting easier to get there. Now it's not easy, but getting easier to get there. So my question really is like, is do we reach a point whereby it becomes, gets a point whereby it pulls back? I think, yes, I understand what you mean, but also it's all about speed and understanding what the next best thing is. The next best thing is, well, will always be on the internet. Mm. You just have to identify it quickly. One thing I've noticed about the best entrepreneurs I've, I've, I've met so far, all the millionaires I've met, they all move quickly. So when COVID happened, people that had events, real life events, that was their entire business. The best one shifted to mm. Zoom events quickly because they saw the opportunity and they took it. Now they're making millions. And then I feel like if the online opportunity of communities, LinkedIn, social media close out, there's going to be a, another new gap within the internet that we need to capitalize on. Mm -hmm. But it will keep on going. It's the same with AI. People feel like the AI craze has already died, but I think it's just shifted to something else is the next best thing. So like I was talking to people, I, I personally thought, okay, AI is just done. Like charging mm -hmm. people, no one cares. But there, all these AI tools <laughs> are now normal. And I don't think it'll ever die down. You just need to move with the speed of it. Yeah, you've been probably one of the best at picking those opportunities and running with it because you had the agency, then you decided it's more education-based. What's your decision-making process for moving between those vehicles? Because most people would stick with one vessel, but you almost reinvent, reinvent yourself every six months without niche hopping. And there's a very important distinction there. That's a good question. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Oh, okay, all right. Oh, thank you. I love it. Okay. Thank you, you want to repeat the question? <laughs> yeah, this is chill. We're just going to go back and forth. So like for you, you're finding the, you've been really good at spotting the opportunity, yeah. right? Where most people will get stuck in their vehicle and their vessel. Now for you, it's always been LinkedIn. It's always been writing. But what's allowed you to spot those opportunities? Because most people will get stuck in running an agency, you're running a coaching offer. But you, you're very adaptable. I feel like the main thing for me has always been I have the immigrant mindset. We only have one choice and we need to go for it. Whatever we spot, we need to run towards it. There's mm -hmm. no other choice. And then if not, if it doesn't work, then we pivot. And then we pivot again. And then we pivot again because we know that that one shot is probably the like last one we'll ever get. So I never take anything for granted. If I if I see something I think my, I might be good at, then I'm gonna go have a go at it. <laughs> I'd rather do the thing and do it wrong than not do it at all. So that's my entire kind of like ethos so far this year. I've only just like kind of like realized it was. Mm. And that's why I've been moving so fast. Like money loves speed and I like running marathons. So it's more about that for me. And maybe the opportunity for LinkedIn never, was never there. Most people would have said it wasn't. But I just saw, okay, this looks cool. And it was fun. I just went with it. What's the change in mindset from, I've seen like a lot of people pushing, growing an audience in 2022, 2023. 
And now it's about monetizing an audience. Have you seen that observation that you grow with the intent to monetize? It's almost like the next tier again, like the evolution of LinkedIn or Twitter. Yeah, I see it a lot and I think it's wrong. I'm a creative first, entrepreneur second. So hmm. I've always wanted to grow an audience, regardless of the outcome, whether it was monetizing or uh, even the agency. I was growing my audience just for fun. Clients came as a result of the fun that I was having. I never intended to monetize. Now I'm able to monetize it, hmm. but it, I never did it for that reason. I saw audience growth as a pure indicator of how good I was getting at my craft. And my craft is content creation. Mm. So it was more, how many people can I get into this, like my audience to confirm that I'm doing the right thing. Mm. And then the more they confirm it, the better I get because it just pushes me up. Something I noticed from the new community I just launched, I get so much energy from people. Like that's, I've been awake for the last three weeks <laughs> nonstop because I have so much energy and the people give me that. And it's, it's a weird trait and I am so thankful I have it because I, I feed off their energy and it just keeps, keeps me going. Yeah, let's actually dive into that because I think an interesting observation I have from a client relationship to a customer relationship is I feel like customers give you more energy. Yes, whereas the right like, ones. Yeah, whereas like for a client, it's much more of like a transactional, harder relationship to maintain. Mm -hmm. I think the dynamics are different. And I'm the exact same. Like I get so much energy from the community. I get so much member energy from members taking information and actioning it versus you doing it. Yes. Why is that? I think there's a lot of pressure on us to deliver the thing. And if the client isn't doing the right thing, we can't do our art. Like it's, it happened to me with the agency where I knew the thing worked, but they weren't executing on the other thing, which was either their offer, they didn't have the stories or they just didn't want to talk about it. And then they'll come to me being like, I want to build a personal brand without being personal. <laughs> how am I going to do that for you? I'm yeah. so sorry. They're like, I want to get too technical. And I'm like, to me, that, that isn't what parcel branding is. Mm. So it's just not going to work out. With clients now, and the community has been amazing. People watch my stuff. They see me execute and they go and implement themselves without me having to write the content for them. Mm. Then I still have some credit for that because I push them towards that. The majority of like my most successful case studies from the community and the, the cohorts that I run I, I don't remember them, on, I didn't remember them until week eight, where they were like, hey, Lara, by the way, we've grown 10,000 followers and we made $10,000 so mm -hmm. far. I was like, wait, what? I literally shouted at you week two to do this thing. And they're like, yeah, we actually went and executed on that. Oh, wow. I think it's more like the mentorship relationship where I'm like, I'm here and they're like here and they're like trying to get to my level, looking up, respect. Mm -hmm. I think respect is the only exchange with clients because they're exchanging high, like high ticket money for us, they expect us to deliver that and that's it. Mm. They, we have all the pressure. With them, it's like it's on them to mm. do the thing. It's not on me anymore. Uh, I've said this many times on the podcast, but it's so interesting when you sell done with you versus done for you. Because yes. done for you is like you need to believe me. You need to trust me that I can execute on your writing or create your podcast. Done with you is you. I need to put trust in you and you need to believe in yourself to do it and it's like at the end of the day do you do, do you really say the things do you really do the things that you say and do you believe the things that you think about yourself like are you going to get up and write the content are you going to create the stories are you going to go back to your life look at all the transformations that you've made but it's very interesting to observe who actually succeeds like that and who doesn't so a question for you on that is as someone who is buying these programs <clears throat> what's the behaviorals behaviors patterns and characteristic traits of people that succeed in the program versus people who actually fail in the program because there's always going to be a percentage and it's trying to minimize people who don't fail. I think one, limiting beliefs. So many people just think they can't have it. The stories it, you tell yourself. There is literally that. And I, I remember one of my best clients, her name was Alexis. It's Alexis. We hopped on a call, welcome call for the fast cohort. And she was so anxious. She was so nervous. She's like, Lara, I can't do this. I can't do that. And I stopped her. I was like, Shut up, <laughs> literally, yeah. tough love. You got it, you've got this, this job, you've got this skill and you've got this, you use it. Mm. Eight weeks later, she's, she's going viral on LinkedIn every single week. Millions and millions of impressions every single week now, just because we rearranged that full pattern onto just do it. Mm. What's the worst thing that can happen? 
you don't get any likes, you go back to your job, you stay there, what's the best thing that could happen? Everything. Mm -hmm. Your life can change. So having that and having someone telling you and being the physical embodiment of what the product is has helped me a lot because it's like, I was here, now I'm here. You can do it too. There's yeah. nothing special about my journey. There's nothing special that I did that you can't do. And storytelling comes in so clutch. I know you read uh, Study Worthy and you loved it. Dude, I mentioned that book like every 20 minutes. I, I should have had fully You literally code. always tell me, like, have you read it? I'm like, no. Dude, I literally, <laughs> you have, love it. Did you read it? No. <laughs> what? Fuck's sake. You're, you literally pushed storytelling every single day. And it's probably the same framework that you probably teach you have to fucking read it okay I'll read listen it. to the audiobook when you're at the gym when you're going for a walk <laughs> but are you sponsored actually you should actually bring him into your coaching offer to uh to speak on a weekly call really yeah because he's actually done it for other people he's done it for hamza in the past he's shown up for the community calls nice. but like that's 101 like how people are going to get ahead right he this does is my official these. invite to the author <laughs> of story worth do you want to come to my program yeah he's a cool dude no but storytelling is everything so being the their hero and then showing them that they can be their own hero. Mm. Um, that's one thing. Second thing, consistency. Mm. Every single podcast says this. And I, it's so cliche, but it's so true. And the consistency doesn't come from just showing up, showing mm. up for yourself. Mm. There's, that's why athletes, they, they show up to the gym every single day for like that 0.1% improvement. Mm. Because they know that it will compound. But most people give up because they don't have the patience. So it just kind of discard those that doesn't that don't belong in that space and they need to go some chase something that is worth chasing for them. Mm. Most people want to build a parcel run, but they don't want to do the work. Mm. And that is the main problem. Talk me about the creator mindset. Oh <laughs> it's simple. You just have to you're creating content for yourself and to help your shadow self, right? Mm. That's it. So the more you, the more content you put out, the more reps you put out. It's like a game, playing the infinite game. I know you love that. It's like that. When you start seeing social media as an arena, as something that you're playing at, and you're throwing all your best cards, you're putting on your best avatar, you're gonna win mm. because you're equipping yourself with all these things: the the shield, the 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 sword, whatever. And you're creating more content because you know that as soon as you get all these points, something's gonna work. Mm. But most people don't have it. They just see it as a transactional thing. It's not a transaction. It's a creation. Mm. You're creating work worth looking at. It's interesting, right? Because if you think about why people get into marketing, it's all direct response. So that's why someone might say to you, what's the point of building a personal brand? I can just run an ad. And what, yeah. CP, what, CP, what CPM do I get on my personal brand? It's what's like, the ROI? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? it's, just, it's the stupidest stuff ever, but it's playing a a short-term mindset to an infinite game effectively it's like if you're approaching your content like that then you're already setting yourself up for failure even if you have the best stories in the world which is kind of why you have some ceos that don't get engagement don't get likes don't get followers don't build a cult because yes they've built a business over here but they're so used to like one penny in two pennies out but it's much more of like a longer brand perspective like we've been connected for a long time we're friends we could build something together in the future or do whatever you don't get that if you're just creating a creative, creating an ad, running an ad. So it's like, yes, you can do that, but if you're not if you're not building your audience, you're actually just gonna pay for the audience to come to your offer. I agree. So many people are playing the short-term game where it's like, how much money can I put in to get this result? Mm -hmm. And luckily for me, because I am not good at maths, I'm not good at systems, I just create <laughs> content. So I've never had that constraint where I'm like, how quick can I get this? How yeah. much input can I put for the output? To me, it's like, how many inputs can I actually put in mm -hmm. to get the output eventually? And I think patience comes in clutch when it comes to the creative mindset and playing the infinite game when it comes to social media. You need to be patient enough to put yourself through the ringer, create the worst type of content ever mm -hmm. so you can actually get better. Like, I am so glad I went to the gym when I was younger and I like, competed because that just teaches you, so, teaches you so much resilience and you have to work for it. Like mm -hmm. it's not gonna happen overnight. If you really want it, you're gonna show up for it. It's the same with content. I got my reps in very early on. I was lucky enough to have run the agency and grown for hundreds of clients. Mm -hmm. And um, then that's how I just was patient enough and got the skills. The quicker you get the skills, the better it's gonna be. But to get the skills, the skills quicker, you need to 
amp up the volume that you're creating at. Yeah. And you're the perfect example for your for what you teach. And I always think the best case study is yourself, right? No matter if you have a hundred clients and now we're here and now they're here, if you can do it for yourself, which you've done over and over again. Yeah. And you've also not burned your brand and looked like an idiot in the process. Like you've held that to a very high standard. And even looking at the past couple of weeks, so you've launched a new program. The volume that you've put out that's at a high quality yes. is insane. Yeah. But it's actually like it's counterintuitive almost to what people in the content space talk about because you weren't just doing one post a day. You were doing two or three. You were doing testimonials. You are doing uh, webinars. You were watching. Of course, right? <laughs> I had to go back through all of them. Though, and that's my job. My brain is fried from going through them. But at this point though, like when you're looking at that content, you know that you're someone who's who has authority over your audience because you've actually just gone and done it. So then it becomes an, a very natural ascension. Whereas like, this is where people completely overlook the, the authority piece. And you call it the authority equation, effectively. Mm, the authority. Which is basically like, you can't get that. It's like a horse before a cart scenario. So you've basically done that work, which is past three weeks, right? Yes. I don't, I don't think it's sustainable. Like um, someone was asking me, are you going to keep up this volume? Because I was growing so many followers as well. Like obviously with more volume comes more eyeballs, mm. more followers. There's a lot more engagement. Impressions rose. I gained about 10,000 followers in one week, like nearly. So I was looking at it. I was like, I cannot do this at the quality that I retained it at. And I, I would never, ever, ever sacrifice quality for the sake of volume. Never. I know it's counterintuitive to most marketers, especially if you come from the Gary Vee world, but mm. I feel like LinkedIn and building a parcel brand, especially there, it's all mm. about quality and how much you respect your audience. Mm. Your audience is smart. Like m people are just getting smarter with social media. They can't see enough from a mile away. Now it's more like, I'm going to show you the utmost respect by giving you the best tailored content I could ever provide for you. All, all I ask from you is three seconds of your time, a comment, then you move along and you hopefully like me and potentially stay in my network yeah. and then come back for late for more next 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 time and with that comes authority because they know that one i'm always going to deliver mm -hmm. two the hooks are going to always be good and three the content is going to be short concise and they can actually implement it immediately mm -hmm. that's respect is the name of the game for personal branding it's not volume it's not hooks it's not the format it's how much time are you able to save someone mm -hmm. and how immediately applicable it is to them Tell me about, since you've moved to YouTube, what patterns are similar across LinkedIn, YouTube, and X at like a psychology level, which is not different, which is different than the platforms themselves? Yes, YouTube. I love it. Um, the packaging. YouTube is a slightly different beast and it's probably the hardest one out of all. And I am so glad, so glad, so glad I'm playing in that game now. But it's the packaging of, is a thumbnail, resonant with the with the title and is the delivery also equally as good you know this mm. the thumbnail and the title are probably the most important ones but then i've seen so many people with a good thumbnail and titled and yet still flop so it's like the combination of the like the hooks the visual hooks on linkedin is the verbal and image hooks and then the delivery for me the patterns i've noticed is how good is the hook for the title i repurposed my hooks <laughs> from linkedin to youtube and then vice versa now, it's like a exchange. I love the repurposing game. And then the open loops that mm. I write in my content, every single post I write is a hook in itself. So you can take any of my posts and every line is a hook in itself. Naturally, I've done it over time because I've become a skilled content writer and it's helped a lot when it comes to YouTube retention because then I can implement it in them in there and I can just open loops, open loops, open loops, which means Explain. that people actually watch until the end. So what, what is an open loop for people? So you introduce a question or like a phrase and you're like, I'll get into this later. And then you close a loop after. So you say, you say something like, and this is the only thing that could help me, but I'm going to get into this a little bit later. And then you, instead of di disappointing them and having them skip, you tell a story in between, mm. which retains them, right? You, you gather attention with the good hook. You retain it by giving a story and you optimize it by consistently posting on, on all the channels and creating more content that's equally as good. Mm, that's that's super detailed. I like that because if I was to look at your posts, it looks like your top performing stuff on LinkedIn is what you're bringing over onto YouTube. Yes. And I've seen Dakota do that too. 
So is that because you're getting validation on one platform that something hits? Something yes. Sick? That's the lean writing method, but you know, Dickie and uh, Nicholas Cole as well. Really? They, they talk about the expand, theirs is the expansion model. So they start off with a tweet. Tweet can become a thread. The thread can be a blog, a newsletter, a LinkedIn post. It can also be a mini course and it can be a full blown product. Yeah. I think that 100% is what, I, what I've been doing. So I didn't do it because I, someone told me it just came, it's counterintuitive, it's intuitive for a lot of creators. I just make sense. It's like, look at the data, look at the stats. Why would I use a new piece of content when I have all these proven content? Mm -hmm. So yeah, 100%, I would go to my LinkedIn, open this tool called Clio. Um, it's a Chrome extension that I really love using. And then I just saw my 10 top best performing posts. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna take this one, how to optimize your profile for more conversion, whatever. Turn it into a literal YouTube video all I did was add stories a little bit more length and examples on the video. And that was that. Sick. Easy. That's interesting, right? Because most people, when they try to talk about LinkedIn and other platforms suck. Because on LinkedIn, you're competing against the accountant, whereas on YouTube, you're competing against Mr. Beast. Yeah, <laughs> that's so true. But I, I think actually we're always competing with everything else. When we're creators, we're competing not just with LinkedIn creators. I'm competing against... Deliveroo, I'm competing against mm. Duolingo. I'm competing, we're competing for attention, not just people in the platform. We're competing with every, everything, everything else. Mm. Your girlfriend, my mom, whoever it is, it's the attention game. How do we make you addicted to our content? Mm. For me, it's been, how can I make this so quick and snackable that people want more? So it's not just competing with social, it's competing with everything else that could distract your ideal client or customer. Tell me more about that addictive content. So for me, I am a chronic internet user. I don't <laughs> stop. Like I, I love the internet so much. And <laughs> Are you just mindless scrolling sometimes. Sometimes. And it happened. <laughs> I had a good, you know, three year run when I was unemployed and I didn't have a life and I was just consistently wasting my time with, and nice. I was consistently scrolling TikTok and Instagram and whatever <laughs> it was, YouTube maybe. Yeah. Luckily that time of obsession for doing absolutely nothing turned me into a very, what can I say? Um, intuitive creator. Observer. Because I, I've been on the platform so long, I understand what hooked me in. Mm -hmm. So then I took that onto LinkedIn. I'm like, okay, this hook work on TikTok. Why can't I try it on LinkedIn? I'm going to use it. And then it's like, what's making me addicted to TikTok that I can take onto, Insta onto LinkedIn? Oh, mm -hmm. it's uh, the hook. Oh, it's because it's so short. Oh, I feel smart. Okay. People don't want to be educated anymore. They want to be entertained, especially on LinkedIn. That's why LinkedIn content is kind of like changing soon because we're realizing that every single person just wants to be entertained, not just educated. Mm. So you bring in the entertainment by making it short and concise, maybe adding a good photo and having some personality and you're winning. Oh, let's go deeper on this now because this is your like secret sauce, right? So, yes. so taking it from the dumb accountant, Jerry, who works at the big four company, who's just talking about most basic shit you're adding in that personality and i would actually say you're probably one of the first people to do that at a very high level Thank you, you. Know? but it's actually fun right it's not just like i'm a hobo on the street here's my hobo story and i work as a ceo right mm -hmm. it's like actually entertaining and educational so how is the shift going from purely educational across entertainment like how do you con how do you how do you create that content effectively everybody has a story and everybody has a reason why they're doing the thing that they're doing right now so whenever we sit down with clients and I actually just had an accountant that just sold out, like she's selling out her program <laughs> right, because so of boring. this, exactly this. <laughs> uh, accountancy is not boring. It's, it's as boring as you make it. Yeah. So the reasons why Point. people may want an accountant is because they want to live a wealthier life. They want to have remote work. They want to spend more time with their, with their family. Tell that story rather than just, here's how to do your tax accountancy for 2025. No, here's how you can have more time to spend in the Maldives with your family mm -hmm. in 2025. Reason, do your tax filing, whatever. And then you're hooking people in with the story, not just the facts. So imagery. It's, it's about how you present the transformation. People are interested in three things, health, wealth, relationships, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're improving their health, we have to show them. The ads that we see every day, they're not just about the products anymore. They're about the transformation. Mm -hmm. Protein shakes, it's not just protein shake, it's how do you feel after drinking the protein shake? What is the outcome of the protein shake? Going to a new gym. Um, I go to this gym called Third Space. They're not selling the gym. They're selling the energy. They're selling the networking. The experience. And seeing that in real life, I'm like, 
why can't I use that in content? It just makes so much sense. And why is not, why aren't people telling more stories? Because they're shy. People are either cringing at their stories because they don't want to, they don't want to seem like it's all about me, me, me. Guess what? It is about you. Everything mm. is about you. Your life is about you. And I, I think people need to wake up and realize if they don't make the thing about themselves, then they're living for someone else. Your mm. personal brand is all about you. And it should be, it should be like a thank you note to you. Like, I've done this cool thing or I'm building this cool thing. Look at it. Look at it. I call, there's this framework that I, some of my friends have told me I do very well. It's a humble brag. I master the art of the humble brag. What is that? You tell your story, but from a point where you're thankful for it and you're not showing off, you're telling the story as a fact. So the first time I ever did this to a very good extent was like when I got featured in Forbes for the first time, mm. I didn't say, I'm so happy and grateful to announce that I just got featured in Forbes. <laughs> Thank you, Jody, for announcing me, uh, for putting me in that. No, it was like, um, mom, dad, thank you so much for this. Um, today I made it to Forbes cover. It's been in my journal for like the last five years and I finally made it. So mm -hmm. thankful for you guys for supporting me. Um, all I can say is thank you. Now I'm going to go celebrate with my parents. That is a lot more touchy and feely and it's relatable mm -hmm. than just stating the fact, oh, I just got featured in Forbes. Like it. It's different. We want to create empathy. We want to create connection. Mm -hmm. So all of this is to truly have someone see themselves in you, either their current selves or their future selves. It's mm -hmm. all about that. Too many people sacrifice um, connection for quick likes for a viral post. I never do that because I always know there's someone else watching me that wants to be me. How can I give them that one little piece of inkling that they mm -hmm. are on the right path? So it's almost marginalizing your success to make the story seem achievable, achievable, and then not having the ego attached. And that's why I think it's quite interesting if you look at the guys who have big brands, personal brands, but they're ego driven. It's like they've kind of lost touch of reality of everyone who can try to get to that point. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? You see it on you see it on LinkedIn, you see it on Instagram. Obviously, you see people flashing things that I don't think it builds a strong connection. Basically, that's at the end of the day there's that connection gap where it's like, okay, yes, this guy does have the Lambo and a penthouse in Miami, but at the same time, how can, how can I get there? Which is, I think that's better way that you've created it, the way the code have created it, is just here is the actual plan. Because I was basically at step three, two, I one. think that goes back to what you were asking me at the start. Do you think the gap is dying for the internet? I think the gap is dying for that type of content to succeed. Hmm. People are craving connection now more than ever. There's a connection crisis since COVID. So, how can you actually start building that true relationship where people relate to you? Mm. The more people see themselves in you, the more they're, they're going to like you. That's just like common psychological uh, bias by Robert Cialdini. Love him so Love much. him. What a dude. Big fan. <laughs> <laughs> what a bro. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I love you. Um, no, but basically that, the more you're able to relate to someone, the more they're going to like you for who you are because sure. they see themselves in you. So it's not the gap is dying. The gap is dying for really shitty, uh, low effort content that's just braggy or just factual, people want to connect. You've seen it. Um, all these running clubs are happening right now. Why is it? like Tinder dates. Yeah. <laughs> or, um, I don't know. Yeah, the Tinder dates. That's crazy. That's, that's basically what it's from, right? Yeah, I guess so. I don't There's know. There's like a second angle I've seen it. Gymshark doing it. I've seen so many other running clubs happening. I, I started running marathons myself and people are just craving that Mm. bit that social media is missing however then it's being transformed onto social media content so i was talking to someone about why running clubs are working right now people are going to the running clubs offline to then show up show off that they went online and it's creating this like dynamic where people are getting fomo from not being in there but they're you know still being engaged online let's say there's like gymshark run club in london there's someone in california that wanted to be there they're gonna like it and they're gonna they're gonna want to be there so ah. it's creating that that formal approach of i want to be there and i want to be involved how can i be involved when i'm in the other side of the world i'm gonna take part in the online community hmm. and then it's a it's a it's a consistent loop so we're like changing the dynamic now from just purely online to community based mm -hmm. offline and online communities online are obviously taking like they're, they're the biggest thing right now school this entire world, everybody has a community right yeah, now. Yeah, 2024 was like the community It's the community era. era right? right now, I don't know what era this is. Um, we'll find that out. Mm. But it's how can you now turn the community that you have into offline? 
So real life events, yeah. real life podcasts. There's a reason why I don't do online podcasts because I do prefer the online, like the offline. We just come, vibe. we chill, we chat about the dogs. We went to the gym last time. Yeah, we relaxed. We're gonna go for dinner afterwards. Yeah, and you've smash met my food. mom. So, but it's a it's a whole different ball game, and like I think that's where we have so much similarities is because, like as you can tell, I'm so like over indexed on this is because everything. Well, that's why is, you're winning. Everything is just automated though, right? But it almost feels awful like even the guys that own this place they're known to be just very personal a load of guys that are big creators come in here it's a good experience that creates so much more of a network effect than just running the ad or mm -hmm. just having an email automation campaign or whatever it's just all of those things suck the life out of humans which is why people are doing communities i'll tell you a story i met someone recently or a part of america and he was telling me that now that he's in a city, everyone's really busy, right? And they're like, no one's meeting for coffees. We're all busy, we're all running businesses. But he's running paddle events every Saturday. He doesn't even play paddle, but he's going to book a court every Saturday. So when he meets people or when he's chatting to people, he has a, an effective community to drive people to an event. They share the same wins and go on a journey to get over transformation. And then afterwards, then get a protein shake or get a beer, right? But the fact that that is a set event allows people to kind of go through an in real life community. I'm running an event in New York in two weeks time. Are you? Yeah, for all my members. Yeah. And anyone that's a client of OX and basically anyone that's in the content space as well, we're just going to do a private dinner. Uh, I'm just going to rent out a restaurant. I'm just going to pay for everything. I don't give a shit. It's going to be good because that community, mm -hmm. which we can talk about, is one, it's real. And then two, everything you want in business comes from the community anyway. Like just give a bit of context. So. This is why it's interesting to understand clients versus customers, like a very interesting dynamic. Customers I found will become advocates and become evangelists and they will do things without you asking. Introductions, referrals, word of mouth, putting posts on LinkedIn because you've basically enabled them. Like that's the whole concept of sales enablement is to enable people to go off and sell and to do this and do that. So when you enable someone to do it, the, the value, yes, there's tangible values. We got the 10K a month and all this shit. But the intangibles is the non-measurable stuff, which is why I'm so indexed on podcasts, which you're so indexed on LinkedIn and community, because it's not about the ROI. I think, I think just there's just so much people who just don't get that, <laughs> you know? I love that. It's there's so much people who just don't understand that. It's never just about the ROI. The ROI comes after you put in the reps to build the thing that you love. But it's asymmetrical. Right? Yeah, I like it. I and really like that. So if you think about like your journey as an entrepreneur, I know you said you're a creator first. Was I? So was I. Mm. I just created a podcast and I was working in tech at the time. And then inbound, I started getting opportunities. People say, well, how would the podcast work? And how does this look? And year one was very awful. Year two was better. Year three, it kind of boomed on. So your results on content are asymmetrical and so are in a business context. But I think that's why there's just a very big divide between who's the winner and who's the loser. It's more like, I like what you said. Um, we're willing to do the things that people want. It's, I was talking to some of my clients the other day. They're like, why are we not growing? And I'm like, it's all about effort, not perfection. How much are you willing hmm. to put yourself out there with effort? So I was analyzing someone's feed and I, I'm obsessed with this guy. His name is Pierre. And he creates the most incredible b2b infographics i've ever seen and i'm a big fan like i'm a raving fan mm -hmm. he was putting in the effort he wasn't going for perfection it was effort it was the infographics i could tell he took hours to make um the insights i learned probably years of learning for him and that is what builds someone's trust it's not mm. just a platitude not just like an infographic but someone holding a sign it's something that I can tell, <laughs> something I can tell. I actually took time and brain power to create. Mm. I, as a creator, appreciate when something is said so simply, but it's mega complicated, a Feynman method. So yeah. incredible, such an incredible tool to use for any creator. The more you simplify a topic, the better you get at understanding it, the more respect people have for you because you, you, you just explained something that they had a question about in simple terms, which makes them feel like they can trust you because you've explained it at their level and now they can see you here mm. and hopefully like over time, they'll get to your level as well. That is entirely my LinkedIn strategy, simplifying complex topics. Mm. And people love that. People like understanding things, because, but, pe but the education system has 
ruin it all for us. <laughs> because that's a good point. That's a we, very, very we believe good point. that education and growth should be hard, but in reality, it's so simple. Mm. And even with the crypto markets, like when I started getting into the Bitcoin, like Dogecoin, the way I learned about the crypto market wasn't reading books, it was through memes. <laughs> Explain. So it's just getting smarter or richer isn't about how clever you sound, it's about how well you understand something quickly. Okay, this is really interesting. It's also kind of topical for me because I'm someone who's action first, fail forward. You know, I'll just move forward and it won't even count it as like a failure. I'll just continuously use action to figure things out. But I'm seeing a bit of a shift in <laughs> some people chasing the status of how something is perceived and how something mm. looks, mm -hmm. how your offer looks versus how much money you're making. Mm -hmm. And an observation I've made is the people that chase status have the least amount of uh, revenue being generated. And in contrast, people who fall forward, kind of like what you were doing, building in public for a long time, what I've been doing over time generates bigger businesses. So it's almost like in um, uh, an inverse relationship by how much you're driving towards optimizing for status versus how much money you're actually making. This could be how your logo is designed, whether you don't have a logo, whether you have a landing page, whether you don't have a landing page. Like at the end of the day, people like uh, Jasmine Alec just has a Calendly link and it's, what is it? Right. What is it? $600 for consultation, right? He makes so much money from that. And that, that guy's just crushing it and he's it's chilling crazy. out in Bosnia. You know what yeah, I mean? He's so it's just, it. it's just interesting to observe, right? He's He has his kid, he's relaxed. He's not interested in building a huge business. He's not status driven. And instead, he's built the biggest audience, most engaged people. He makes the most, he makes a ton of money, and he's chilling in Bosnia, right? Contrast that to someone who's trying to get all the bells and whistles in place. It's kind of like when you build a startup and you want everything to look perfect in your, all oh, design and UX is perfect. Those companies always go to zero, mm -hmm. and it's the same with content, same with everything. It's just, just the, it's the optics. It's an ego thing. Mm. The moment I stopped trying is when I became it. Because I got the reps in, I created this environment where I was happy creating in, and then mm -hmm. everything else came. Never had a website until my landing page that you like. Dude, <laughs> we got to talk about that next. But, you, uh, you have literally the best landing pages thank you. always, though, for like the past year. Yasmin helped design it, you know that. Fuck, dude. Yeah, we we were we created the first iteration like uh, two hours before it, the actual cohort went live. Yasmin designed it on Canva. Did you write it? I wrote most of it. Yasmin just designed the, the fast bits and then we've iterated from the... Sorry, sorry. <laughs> this is so interesting. The design was done on Canva. On Canva. What do you mean it was done on Canva? What so was obviously the, the, the optics of it were, were the designed L on The Canva. LA. The, oh, the LA now, like that's new now. But uh, the how it looks overall, the, like the customer experience was designed on Canva at the start. And then... <laughs> It just goes to show how good Yasmin is at his work and how, you know, savvy you can get with Simplicity stuff. skills. Simplicity is everything yeah. in this game. And it's like, again, speed. How how quick can I turn this into an actual website with Webflow? And then obviously I had designers that come in and I gave them the, everything else, but mm -hmm. the majority of it was designed on Canva. Then we've obviously iterated now. We have like really top level designers now going inside the platform. Like now it like moves. And Do you want to grow and monetize your podcast, but you don't know where to begin? Have you tried all the tricks and hacks, but nothing has worked? Have you been wasting time, money and energy and seeing an analytics chart with no growth? That's where Vox comes in. We've been helping podcasts grow and monetize their shows for many years. We've grown shows to over 100 million views and over 10 million downloads, generate over $2 million in only the last year alone. And we can help you grow and monetize your own podcast. We've had some shows go from absolutely zero. We've had some of the biggest influencers in the world come to us to help and improve their show. So if you want to learn exactly our podcast grow flywheel and exactly how we can do this for you and completely replicate success, Schedule a call right down below with myself and we can go through the exact model for you and to grow your podcast this year. So it doesn't things. matter though, it doesn't matter because honestly, I had a chat with someone recently, um, like some of the best SaaS companies, especially micro SaaS, are made off of one engineer and AI code writing now, right? Whereas before you needed, if anyone knows about programming, you need front end, back end, UX, UI, a bunch of designers. And that was once clapped people say well don't you got a huge team whereas now if you have lean if you have one designer or one programmer or whatever it's like why would you need more mm -hmm. right 
And, you know, this is coming from someone who has a large team, right? I know that there's obviously different elements to it. Since we last spoke, my business is literally, it's a lot bigger than what it used to be, right? So let's put it that way. So it needs to be, right? There's obviously a layering. There's obviously nuance. But I just think it's an interesting observation that you are at the stage that you're at because you just did it. Just and, for it. And just because you use Canva <laughs> and you just didn't bother. Sponsor me. <laughs> but you didn't bother like worrying about those things. So I just released a podcast with Daniel Bitten, right? A million dollars a month. He's 17 years old. He's making yeah, 600, doing 600,000 a month when he's 15. With uh, Snapchat, no? With Snapchat initially, but now he's a software company. No, I love it. Building those like ADHD, TikTok clips, whatever. Like super ADHD stuff for like 15 year olds. Yeah, yeah. And my question to him was, why is it you could do that? And he was like, I've never, ever thought about something. I just do it. Yeah. He was like, I don't consider planning. I've never built a business model canvas. I just do just the thing that I want to do. And I have no risk. Mm -hmm. And I don't give a shit. And even me at 28, I don't have any risk. Like, what am I going to risk, right? I just think it's super interesting, right? You have that, anti-status. The other crew people over here, major status, making no money, saying it's a scam. Da -da -da -da. Just fuck around, find out. Yeah. Find out the worst thing that could happen again. You're back of where you are, which isn't any less than 100%. where you can be. That was exact logic behind my podcast the entire yeah. time. If I message this person and they don't respond, I'm still in exactly the okay. same position I'm in right now. I think the biggest entrepreneurs have the, the nothing to lose and everything to win mentality. It's mm -hmm. like, there's a bigger risk if you we don't go for it than if we actually go for it. Mm -hmm. Again, what's the worst thing that can happen? You mm -hmm. make some friends online, get some new skills. Some people laugh at you. The best thing that could happen is it could literally change your life. Question for you. Do you ever consider what like your hometown friends think of you now as a result? I don't think of them. Sick. Don't think of them at all. Does that ever fester into your your brain or do you ever see it on your feed or, or whatever? I know you created a new LinkedIn initially. So uh, when I moved away from home, my mom sitting right there. Uh, <laughs> she, super engaged she's, she's chilling <laughs> face in the wrong hey, way she lo they love it they love it hey mom she's never gonna watch this anyway <laughs> um she was like and i think she was a pivotal part to my entire journey she asked me for my sim card she's like you're never getting this life back uh, a bit crazy i was 15 i was like what the f mom and then she's like give me your sim card you're gonna get a new one threw it away never gave up, gave it back to me, but I never asked. Because the life we were trying to build and the life they admired, that they, they aspired for me to have was completely different to what I have in Mexico. And so at the start, when I was changing, I was evolving and I, my life was completely different drastically. I think the best piece of advice I could ever give someone is you have to move out of your hometown where you grew up in. Mm. Otherwise you're gonna have the same small thoughts, the same beliefs, the same identity. And then when I moved to England, everything changed and I was like, I hate you all. You guys made my <laughs> life hell. Yeah. So I was stuck in this identity of like, I was like this girl with this identity. It's not that smart, not that pretty, not that clever, whatever it was. They, I, I was stuck in there. I was, I couldn't move because they treated my, like it, treated me like it. So I was, I felt it. Moved away. I felt like the most smartest, most popular or whatever it was that my goal was. I could be whoever I wanted. Mm. And it all started because my mom took my SIM card away. And now here we, are, here we are, and I don't think of them. I know they think of me. They message me, they're like, so proud of you. And I'm like, nah. you literally made my life hell. Awesome, so true, right? It's just, that's the reality is that, I think about that a lot because when you're on the way up or let's say you've reached minor success, it's so easy to be behind someone, right? And even that friend who was kind of there, but kind of not there, it's so easy for them to kind of clap and like, yeah, let's go for beers or whatever. But let's say it didn't work out for you. And let's say you were just small and not doing great and just doing average and just still inside the mean curve. You were still within the mean. They wouldn't have messaged you at that point. So that's the difference. The only reason why they're messaging you is because you've actually done it. And it's an interesting observation, right? Because you need to understand where you're getting your information from, where the feedback is coming from. Like when you message me with feedback about my podcast or about content, whatever, I listen. Yeah. Because you're someone who I respect. Thank you. And you've done the reps and you've done other stuff and we have similarities and differences. So it's just very, it's very important to understand the source information if you want to take in that advice. Now, the, the obvious advice is like only take advice from people that have the results that you want. But at the same time, we're humans, right? It's just, it's just natural. But I think for me, 
I've had like a lot of like really heavy handbrake turns. But it's always been around this frame. It's like, is that person actually supportive? Did they actually give a shit? Like, if I lost everything, would they? Would they be there? Yeah, one hundred percent not. You can count those people from your heart, the palm of your hand. And and that's the. It's it's also like the reality of just the world in general. Because if you went back like super like old times, right? You only had mental capacity or yeah for who was around you. you didn't have a phone book. You have like five or six people in your ecosystem. You're living in a tribe or whatnot. So it actually is normal to have like five or six people that you would really chime with and and, me- and mess with. And then everyone else, like Dunbar's Rule 101, is just kind of in the ether. Like they're just kind of around and they come for the good times and so on. I think part of growing up, especially in the entrepreneurship work world, is understanding that not everybody is your best friend and not mm. they don't they shouldn't be either. You don't have time for that many people if you have big goals. Mm. I switched to trying to have as many friends as possible to just having acquaintances and that's fine. I'm okay mm. with not being everybody everybody's best friend. And I'm a people pleaser. That was really hard to admit. But now I literally just speak to my mom, my dad, and Yasmin, and this other guy called Luke, and that's it, pretty much. And that, I'm happy with it because mm. I know these people are completely in Lara's team. They want to see Lara grow, mm-hmm. and by surrounding myself with those type of people, I grow, I yeah. flourish. I, it's like the energy. I'm like the combination of the five people I'm around, mm. which is elite performers who are always wanting to the best for me. But the hardest bit for anyone is just that curve that you were talking in where like you don't quite fit in but you're still not there yeah. and people are looking at you like what are you trying to do <laughs> and it's just the loneliest bit because you feel like the misfit you actually miss you don't fit anywhere you don't feel hit there so and it gets lonely and then whoever messages you when that's happening hmm. they tend to be the best people to be around are you familiar with alex g no he's really big in miami here i was in his like twenty million dollar mansion on Is that Friday the blonde night. Guy? Uh, kind of blonde, brown hair. He's from Cuba originally. Uh, he's like a trader. Now he has like multiple different businesses. He's twenty three years old. He's absolute baller. He told me something so interesting that I just can't get out of my head. When he was learning how to trade, he was like seventeen, eighteen years old. He had three group chats. He had one with his family, one with his high school friends, and one with other people learning how to trade. And when he like placed a trade he would write the same message and paste it into all three. In his parents' message, no one would respond. They're like, Ugh. His, his hometown friends, they would be like, what are you doing? I thought you'd give up at this point. And the guys that were learning how to trade, they would all support him and clap, and give him encouragement and show him different areas to improve and so on. And he did that consistently for a long period of time and the same pattern repeated over and over again. And it's because when you're finding people who are on a similar mission to you, you chime with, you may not be there yet, but you're in a series of growth and you're not going to get like effectively hate from them people. Whereas there's people below you that are literally pulling you into the cesspit. And if you don't have the right family, mm-hmm. they will also pull you back because they don't, they don't understand. So his approach to it was that, you know, now many years later, I think honestly, honestly, I think they're probably doing anywhere between 15, 20 to 30 million a year in around that range. Um, he said that his parents still just don't understand what he does. And he said, that's fine, whatever. Obviously, the old friends are gone. And then all of the trader bros that were with him from the beginning have all gone on to continue and and play the game. So it's just an interesting observation because this means that everything is actually like, it's neutral. It's not positive. It's not negative. It's how we interpret it. It's how it is. It is what it is. You take it as face value and you move on. There's uh, this, uh, there's the four agreements. And one 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 of the rules is to not take anything personally. Yeah. And it sounds so simple, but it's so hard in practice. And then I revisit that so much because when I'm getting upset at someone not congratulating me or um, being there when I think I needed them, and I'm like, why are you not there when I was there for you? Then I realized, why am I expecting everything to be so transactional? Mm. And that's a big call out to anyone because um, why am I seeing a good deed that I'm doing as a transaction for them to give me a good deed? That's not how it works. So the more you just approach things with, it is what it is. I'm going to give my best and hopefully I'll get it back at some point. Mm. Life gets so much easier. Good point. Reciprocity works in all different ways, right? It's not just one way no. in the, and one way or the other. Well, I think it's just how you need to remove expectations from your life to actually move forward at the speed that you want. If you're expecting a result from a small action and it doesn't happen, the chances of you stopping and getting angry at it 
are, are higher than you just keep on going. Mm. So I removed all the expectations. I'm like, I'm going to do what I, what, what I know what to do mm-hmm. and the result will come. Good point. Now, walk me through your coaching offer now. So my observation is like a lot of these individual courses are sold out to individual courses and that's kind of it. Whereas for you, you've built out more of a program and you've added as the cost of a course, but you've added on more bells and whistles. Why is that? For the community. Yeah. You said yeah. you've built out the community with that. So pre, I, I went full monk mode for two months. I've removed all the coaching offers that I had. So no one-to-one, nothing. I was like, leave me alone. I need to go in a rabbit hole and actually just focus on building this course. So you went to like zero revenue? Literally all I did was obviously I had the other cohort running. So that's like monthly recurring revenue from the other cohort. And besides that, I like- How was that structured? Like so after the, after the cohort, it was uh, five 400 a month for a few members to stay. So oh, we went from 2.5K main price for eight weeks to then monthly membership uh, for 100. It's a big price for membership. So kind of did it well, not as well as I could have done, but I didn't market it. I was like, if you want to stay and hang out, let's do this. But in the meantime, I'm going to be building this other thing. And then mm. they were fine with it. I'm lucky enough to have a good audience that really does care about my opinion and they want to have me as their coach. So that was good. But besides that, I went all the way to zero, but it was fine because... I, I got to do this thing, which is the most amazing thing. It's like a course. So structured a course about 40 lessons inside, eight modules, plus a community. Weekly co- coaching calls with me to all the people inside of the community. You get to ask a question, I get to answer, and that's it. Mm. Pretty lean, a lot better. The eight-week cohort was great. But the problem was that I have such a large audience now, and I will never, ever take it for granted. Never. And what I noticed was, is that people want to learn, but they just can't afford it. Mm. And I was one of those people. And I was like, what can I do to provide this information, but obviously still monetize it. I'm not going to give it away for free. Cause I, in reality, I've given 99% of my, comp- <laughs> my everything it's for free. It's already there. It's already there. People feel like they need to buy the thing to actually implement. I am that person. I've bought tens of thousands of like courses, cohorts, programs, took in, taken the, the lead magnets, everything. Still don't apply it. I probably have millions spared, like stored in the content that I haven't, that, that I bought, that I haven't implemented. Good point. Be- that, that was free because I don't have a stake in. You have to have, you have to give yourself tactical anxiety. Mm. This is something from Dakota to actually implement the thing. Otherwise you're going to be like, oh, I can do it later. Courses in total have a, a, f- um, a finish rate of 40%. You know, people will buy the course. They'll never take it well, because they get the dopamine from buying it, but implementing it is just an, another different ball, ball game. Sorry. So they 40% of people who buy complete or 40 or they complete 40% of the course. 40% of people who buy never complete the course. No, 40% never complete. Yeah. So 60% complete. Yeah. There's like around that, like mm. 40 to 60%. It's crazy. I was, I was doing some research for the marketing of the cohort and the community. And hence why mm. I added a community to the course. Because I'm accountability. like, accountability is everything. The game is so simple. You just have someone, you just need someone to believe in you. Yeah. And to me, that's entire blueprint. Do the action, then show it up. Um, when I was growing my agency for the first time, I bought this course. It was the worst course of my life. <laughs> I borrowed my last, I, had, I spent my last $500 and I borrowed another 500, 500 for my dad. And I was like, this course is going to change my life. It promised the world you can make $10,000 live in Bali while being a social <laughs> Over <media here>. manager. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I want that. The course was really bad. It didn't have any video. It was all text. It was awful. But the one thing that came out of it was the Facebook community I was inside. Mm. And in that, I started surrounding myself with people that were thinking different. Mm. They were like trying to do something. The people I was surrounded with before at home, they were trying to do the nine to five. Uh, they were trying to go to parties. They were trying to drink. Mm. And I was like, okay, these people are making some money doing this internet thing. Mm. And then from pure jealousy, I was like, I want to show off my wins. And then guess what happened? I went and took the time to implement what I was learning, even though it was shit. Didn't make any money of it, but I was doing the sales calls that they were telling me to do. I was doing the networking that were telling me to do. Mm. And over time, my skill set improved just naturally by default because I was doing the thing. Then the more you have people to relate to, the more you have an accountability body that you want to be. Mm. I operate purely 
from a competitive angle where I just want to beat someone. I'll choose someone. Um, I want to beat you and move to the next one. <laughs> I beat them and it, it, it's a repeat. It, it works for me. It's never malicious. It's just a, yeah. a friendly competition type. And hence why um, I'm growing on YouTube so fast because I'm, <laughs> I'm beating the folks <laughs> up. So yeah, that to me has been the biggest unfair advantage is having someone to keep you accountable to the thing that's actually in your same wave mm -hmm. length and they're trying to support you and then you can cha exchange notes. If you and I started going to the gym, you look at me like, oh, why are you doing your reps? And, no, okay, you loser. Mm -hmm. Do you really want it? And this is the same trait I found with every high performer. They are consistently holding you accountable to what you said. Mm -hmm. And that shifts your mindset to, I can't do it or why can't I do it? How can I do it? They're doing it. They're not, they're not that smart. I can do it as well. It's a level of frustration, right? Yeah. That's been very important for my journey too, because sitting and having these conversations, why am I not acting on information, right? So, especially in the beginning, now I'm obviously doing it, right? But in the beginning, I was like, okay, this person is similar to me and you. He's making 10K, 30K, 50K, 100K. What's the difference? The difference is he's just doing it and I'm just talking about it. Yeah. Now, obviously, this is my variation of content and putting out content, but there's also that point where it's like, we are all very, very similar. There's only difference there are those small little changes that's holding each other accountable and going actually getting the work done. Yeah. Okay, that's really interesting about the, about the community, keeping them accountable. It was more, to me, um, the thing that inspires us the most is the story. And mm. it's like, if she could do it, I can't do it. You, you switch the why them to how can I. Mm. And it's the most powerful mental reframe that you could ever have because you turn your anger into power or energy or whatever it is to fuel yourself upwards rather than down. Mm. Anger... And I don't know, there's like the, the waves of like energy, right? There's anger and then like, I don't know, positive gratitude. Yeah. So if you operate from a place of gratitude rather than anger, then everything you'll attract immediately becomes amplified and you start being abundant because you're receiving rather than just holding on to the thing and having a grudge to it. Hmm. Hmm. I like that a lot. How do you find running that model now as itself so let's say let's just take a step back what was your launch strategy like what was the email campaign i was on the email list emails are sick I'm gonna, I'm you were getting my emails i'm gonna rip them off you <laughs> <laughs> no I, I wanted to analyze how you which did one it. was your favorite did you read any of them um he didn't read any of them i know i did i have i have them all don't you worry i liked how you offered discount so okay 37 percent off was good it's funny yeah we i think it's, i think it's good because like there needs to be a, a mechanism to get people to actually make a decision, right? Like now versus I think a problem with programs, courses specifically, is that you can get it whenever. So oh, fuck it. I don't want it today. I'll get it next month or so on. So there needs to be like that specific time zone. I think that's a challenge that I've had and we can talk about what I've adjusted in my program too. I think it's way easier to sell in now versus open for anything, mm. whether it's an agency whether it's coaching. I went back and forth with Dickie on this a lot, which was our cohorts bigger, better than open coaching. And you have to run the numbers for your own audience. His was open coaching, but he still runs it in weekly intakes. So it's kind of like a mini cohort anyway. Is this in, uh, is, do you understand this? Yes, I yes. go a bit more detail. So let me, let me explain. I'm going to go a bit of a tangent. So I have a mo my coaching offer for quite some time. We sold a ton under an eight-week course um, time frame. Yeah. Eight week you launched. program. Yes. Cohort. Yes. Cohort, sorry. Yeah, was and that? You were asking for a website. Yeah, sorry? I think you we were like talking about a website when you were going to build yours. It was oh, yeah, yeah. I built it myself. I built everything myself. I love it. Um, I used to come from software. So whatever. Oh, yeah, fine. you're a tech. Yeah, a software bro. But basically when I, when I launched on our cohort, it was actually easier to sell. Because it was like, this is the dream outcome. It's eight weeks. Yes. And this is the process. And then I got a bit cocky and I said, fuck it, I'll just change it to open coaching. People can come in, anytime. buy it. Yeah, anytime. They'll get access to a year. And then during that process, they can go through the program and then they'll also have their weekly calls and they'll get one or two one-to-ones with me. Right. Okay. Because that's more of like a longer commitment. They're going to get more. But what I noticed was people wanted the dream outcome in less time than to actually be in a program longer and get more results. Mm -hmm. So if you, so you didn't want to get less results in a shorter time, amount of time. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing some mental gymnastics on that. been doing a lot of economic models on that. But what you've been able to do is just So wait, what's working best? For me, cohort. But I know that you can crack it 
Because that's what all big programs are. You buy in my guys' program, you buy any of these people, it's all open, right? But it's just the problem with it, and I've gone very deep on this, is the fact that your offer runs dry and you need to get better at running re-offers. Mm-hmm. You can't just run re-offers by saying, oh, it's 25% off now and then price is going up again next week because people will get used to the re-offer and then that becomes, sat- not saturated, but it becomes dry. So there needs to be what you have done, which is a 21-day sequence, running webinars, running something more um, fun mm. because otherwise the webinars run dry, everyone's seen the same emails and just the actual like client acquisition costs just goes up and up and up. And this is even if you're doing organic because you know the time of client acquisition when it's organic is it's your time, right? So you switched back to cohort? Uh, we're still deciding on that. <laughs> so now you can now it's still open. So coaching. I think it's a, this is the entrepreneur creator dilemma. Yeah. The person that's doing cohorts wants to do courses, the courses want to do masterminds, the masterminds want to do webinars, the webinars want to do everything. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an endless loop of like shiny object here, shiny object there. Course of competence. I saw this on the Chris Williams podcast. The course of competence where you're so good at something that you know you could be good at the other thing and you can't wait to do the other thing and you feel bad because you're not appreciating the good thing that you're good at, but you're competent in everything else. You could be doing the other thing Mm -hmm. and it makes you frustrated because you're not doing it, but you're executing on this thing that you're good at. And then it just, it's frustrating. It's like a lot of people will say it's the best problem to have. It's like a cutesy little champagne problem. Mm -hmm. But for us, it's like, I could be doing that. I could be doing that. Or like, there's that people, that person's making millions with this and I could be doing that. And it's just like understanding that whatever we do, we're never going to be happy with like, there's always going to be a problem with the cohort. There's always going to be a problem with the cause. Yeah. For me. Pros and cons are everything, right? Everything. But, but that's interesting because like I view it all as the same, but just a delivery, a different delivery mechanism. As I'm just very interested in this space in terms of how you can set up how you can solve the same problem in different ways. Different ways. Yeah. For different people. Do you want to know how we book the most amazing guests on our podcast like you're seeing today? I've created a full template and guide and every single script that I've ever used to get the best guests in the world. And I've put everything together in a simple step-by-step process. If you click the link down below, I'll give you the exact guide to book any guests on your podcast. And I have a full guest management system for you to manage every single guest. If you wanna see the process behind booking guests like Justin Waller, Luke Belmar, Sterling Cooper, and every guest in the online business space, click the link down below and you'll get the full guide for free. Thank you. Yeah, so like done, but like done for you is just done for you, <laughs> but done with you can be broken into so many different variations. And I think it just goes down to the entrepreneur's hat is like the economic model on the back end, which again, I've been putting a lot of focus on in terms of like optimization of that. Yeah, I've seen the... You've seen the graphs. The graphs. <laughs> but then let's take let's take a look at yours because like the 249 low ticket, I would call that low ticket. Low some ticket, degree. indeed. How did you come up with that? Why did you settle on that price? What's the approach? So for context, I run two previous cohorts, eight week programs, very successfully. Uh, one was a six figure launch and I'd never sold anything like that before. I never sold to my audience prior to that. So there were big challenges and I'm really grateful for that. What I noticed was the first one was 997, the second one was one $2,500. And again, big, big audience, I was like, how can I provide people with information? So I was like, I'm gonna price this as the cheapest price I can. I, we analyzed the market, we saw which courses were priced as what. Normally 997 is the magic number. <laughs> I was gonna do 597, but we felt like, no, let's do 296, I think it was, and add a discount. And For that, the only reason was accessibility. I want everybody to get their hands on because I want them to have, to feel like it was such a steal, they're gonna tell their friends about it. Word of mouth marketing is not talked about enough on social media, especially in the space of the creative space. People think it's just the launches, the marketing that we do, the ads, the inputs. What about what other people are saying? That's way more powerful than what I could say. So for this launch, 40% of my marketing wasn't made by me. It was made by my audience. And that was so powerful. They were posting testimonials. They were telling people to join. For months, they've been like waiting for their friends to join. Like they were like, Lara, when are you launching the next one? Like my friends want to join. I'm like, I don't know, (laughs) leave me alone. Having raving fans that love the product promote something for you has been the best way 
mm. to build authority, which you were talking about earlier, because I'm not saying anything. I just, I am it. How did you, how does that happen though? Because you, you have a very unique way. I care. Yeah. I care. And that's something that people sacrifice for the sake of revenue. And I never actually stopped caring. I want every single person that's in my comments, in my cohorts, in my communities, whatever it is, I want every single one of them to succeed. Mm. Hence why I spent hours still commenting on my, on my, on my content because my growth isn't mine, it's theirs. Like it's, it's, it's a journey. Like I'm taking them with me. Like, like thank you. Yeah. So the only, the, the, last, the, the only thing I can do for them is give them the information and also care about them. How are you? Mm. How is your wife? And mm. then that creates true community. Like at least how, that's how I built it mm. through consistent content and showing up for them. And that's why they, they showed up for me when I needed them. Without me asking, we are in realistically. How does that scale? the community like how do you scale your community now to keep it personal keep it growing because you're going to get to like a million soon and like you're playing a much different game than let's say like justin welsh who's like i'm just chilling <laughs> you know <laughs> like you're, you're playing much more of like the the empire build like you're you're going to keep on growing so like how do you keep that level of personalization i'm still trying to figure it out i don't know it is a problem every single entrepreneur i ever ask for help they're like Outsource your engagement. Uh, oh, out, no. Start outsourcing your content. Start outsourcing this. Start outsourcing your scripts. I can't. I physically can't because I will lose what I built. So many creators that have made it to the millions lost had the thing, which was personality, the relatability, the story. And they stopped telling it because of the scalability. Every single coach I've ever been to, they try to put SOPs in my head, frameworks, systems. And again, it is why I'm a creator and not an entrepreneur because I don't fucking care about hitting a million as fast as possible. I care about hitting 1 million people that care about me as much as I care about them. Mm -hmm. So it's unfortunate because mm -hmm. so many people come to me like, Dar, you could be doing so much money. One, I don't want to. Two, I'm creating, it's an art. It's mm -hmm. not a business in itself. The business has come as a default. And I am so passionate about it because it's just like, the the artist's way almost. Yeah. Um. Everything I do is a performance, and I hope you guys like it. That's sick. That's so sick. That's why I always say entrepreneurship is a journey of self discovery. It's yeah. Kind of a path for profitability. I love it. And it's interesting because like if you were in the content, the video game, like you know, like the video podcast space, you would need to outsource it, right? Because you would need to outsource like your well, obviously your editing, but I mean your scheduling and so on and so forth. But when it comes to writing. That's like as pure as it gets, right? It's literally like words on a screen or words on a pen, on a, on a paper. So it's like you couldn't outsource that. And even if you did, the scheduling would save you like six minutes. So it's not necessarily worth it. You can also schedule you know, your own content on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. I find that quite interesting. It's like, yes, I understand that entrepreneur dilemma, but it's also like not really applicable to like a writer. No, it is not. Even um, I recently tried to outsource my scripts and it just isn't working because they're using phrases I wouldn't use. I was recording this video and I filmed it with their script with like, they edited it and I didn't realize that they had it gone in mm -hmm. and I was reading it and they used an analogy that I would never use. And I was like, and I understood that they used the analogy to make the video longer, to add like this rehawk. And I was like, I hate it. Hate to take it out. I hate it. I couldn't. Mm -hmm. uh, I tried to outsource. I'd rather spend 10 hours on a five minute video then spend five minutes and hate the But isn't thing. that the craft though? I it don't is understand the, it this. Is the, it's a 20%. I read this book, 2X is Better Than 10X by uh, Dan I've Sullivan. been recommending that so many times. It's such a good book. And in one part, he talks about Mr. Beast. And it's like Mr. Beast was posting one video a month that would get a million views. He could have been posting four, four videos yeah. a month to get you know 500,000 views each. But he decided to optimize for his craft and then release everything else. Mm. So. From that book, I realized that I needed to stop listening to all the entrepreneurs that are telling me to that tell me to outsource a thing that doesn't scale because that's what scales me the fastest. So that's interesting that you made that point. That's exactly been the thesis around our tour now. Because my whole logic is, I've said this at least every single day. If I can just come here, bring as much energy as possible, listen intently, optimize this video for what we're doing, mm -hmm. I don't need to go create 500 clips from it the content itself will become yeah. 
personified. It would become 100%. its own thing. So if I just focus on like the craft, like I have like three more to go this week. And if I just go all into those videos and put as much effort into it as possible, that becomes everything that I want. It's happened time and time again. It's not the clips. It's not posting my newsletter. It's not posting on LinkedIn. They're just nice add-ons. Do you get me? They're just things that happen as a result. But it's a very interesting observation because let's say take your example. You focus so much more on the craft. So you'll spend an extra 10 minutes writing, even reviewing it. Okay. Extra 30 minutes. 10 whereas, hours. whereas most people will just post their LinkedIn posts. Yeah. They just post just to post just yeah. to get the reps in. And that's, that's the worst thing well, that you could do. Dude, um, how to be said, said it perfectly with this is that you can be consistently shit for seven years. Yes. Unless you make the change, right? So people in the YouTube space, they just don't change, which is genuinely why I'm here. Because I, similar to you, I just feel like that I get stale very quickly. So, and I also get bored. Like, you know, we just, I just get bored recording podcasts that are at home, front on Zoom, fucking clicking this, clicking that, record, and it's just not personal. Where I was like, I want to come to the US. I want to do something cool. I want to do something different. And I want to create like a new standard. And even like I talked to you before about how we're running these episodes now. Yeah. People are not running episodes like this anymore at the moment. And I want to try create a new standard, not to be cool and edgy, but because it's just not done before. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I don't know. It's just like, you kind of go full circle. It's like that, uh, <laughs> it's like the JK Molina post I saw years ago, which is like when you're trying to start out you're like zero K a month or whatever it is. And your email is like hotgirl69 at gmail.com. And then you're making 10K a month and it's like Darren at Lee mm. at Vox.co. And then you're making hundred K a month and it's like <laughs> sexygirl69 at gmail.com. You go full circle, right? And I've noticed that too with even like my sales, my marketing, what worked in the beginning. It works again. Yeah, with, with the idea of obviously staying within like a, a few like ideas and frameworks, but your intuition, providing you're not a potato, is usually the best approach, which is for you, right? It's like, do I get the scripts or do I not get the scripts? Yeah. So, right. And actually tell you a funny story on this. So people probably know me as like building podcasts, but we all, we do a lot of other stuff too. Like we build the offers on the back end, you know? I don't know, are you familiar with this? Yes, I am. Yeah. So that's where like most of our money is made, to be perfectly honest. Sometimes, whatever. <laughs> but what's interesting there is that someone has to be really, really involved, right? They have to like, you know, almost give us over this process. And there's been a lot of people that shown them the numbers, shown them the opportunity. All right, this is what we do. This is the podcast. This is how much traffic we can get. This is how much revenue we can make. And if the person isn't bought into the process, I was like, all right, it's not for you. Yep. You know, because mm -hmm. the 60, 90 days that I could spend is just not worth it unless someone is fully bought into the vision and the idea. And that's kind of like, these, you want to be playing this game for long term. It, yeah, 100%. If you don't work with someone that is aligned with your values, they're not fit. Mm. And I think it's the hardest thing when you're starting out because at the start, you just want to get everyone. Yeah. You want to <laughs> get hired by your dream client and then trying to go for it. And then you realize this is draining me and this is not aligned with the vision that I'm going for. You don't even have values in the beginning. You don't, you don't want, you just, you just want money. You just want to make it. You just want something. Yeah. But then, um, and I still face this problem sometimes. It's like the scarcity mindset that came from being a freelancer, or whatever, starting a business, where you're trying to take all the opportunities, saying yes to everything. Mm. But eventually you have to start saying no to things that you would have said yes before. And that's really hard. Mm. But then when you say no to something, you say yes to yourself and you say yes to those opportunities you're trying to align to. I like it. Okay, tell me about how this is kind of impacting you personally. Every time I message you, you're up for like, you're, you're sleeping like two hours a night. I haven't like slept. You're, you're super young. You're like miles ahead of so much other people at this point, like top, like female creator, all that kind of stuff, whatever. But like, how do you manage everything yourself? Cause you're, you're super small team, right? You don't have like a big team. No. Whereas for me, like I'm chilling half the time <laughs> cause I have the infrastructure. It's a different, it's a different business, right? But how do you think about that? How do I think about like how do you manage your your, your time personally? Like what do I you don't, do? Yeah. Don't have time. <laughs> I am consistent. Like I currently I'm on running on four hours sleep. I told you before this podcast. Like I am literally going to crash after this podcast. Mm. I'm so excited to be alive. Mm. Like and that's what, the only thing that's driving me is excitement. I that's the thing. The mm. secret sauce is excitement. I'm not nervous. I'm excited to be here. I'm so grateful to be in this situation right now where I get to live my wildest dreams. 
I'm in Miami right now with you. Chilling. I was in London two days ago. Um, <laughs> my mom is right here looking at the podcast. Like, why, why sleep when I could just be building this whole thing? I don't know how much time I have mm. to do this. Like, the opportunity may close. Tomorrow, LinkedIn may not exist. Mm -hmm. Why am I wasting time trying to make time for things that I actually don't care about? Mm. Don't care about the parties. Don't care about drinking. Don't care about, you know, this other event. Don't care about this, okay, watching the series. I care about building this cool life that the internet is giving me the chance to. That's how I do it. I don't, I don't have systems because I, one, hate them. Two, don't know how. Don't have a team because I hate hiring. I don't know how <laughs> to hire. And I have to assume the consequences. Yeah. And that's okay. I'm happy doing it all because I enjoy doing the whole thing. I'll do mm. the systems for the, for the cool hole. I'll do the sales if you want. I'll do the VSL. I wrote the copy for the website. I, <laughs> you know, did the, the scripted all the emails. I've, throughout this launch, I did 20 emails, you know, 25 LinkedIn posts, 10 video testimonials, uh, sent all, all the 10 um, emails to the wait list um, over, I don't know, probably a month's worth of recording for video for the course, mm. plus six months prior to do the prep. And I would do it all over again. Mm. Please give me, I want to do it all over again. I love it so much. So what's your like daily and weekly routine around work? Because it seems sporadic. It is very sporadic. <laughs> I think I may have ADHD. Same. I had someone tell, tell me that on the podcast. <laughs> Maybe it's just, I don't know. It's all yeah. scattered a little bit, but I feel like it's because we are able to work all day that we allow <laughs> ourselves to be scattered. Yeah. If we had a nine to five, then it would be like this, this and that. I can't really schedule time because most the majority of my time is creative. So I don't mm. know when creativity is going to come. I can't schedule it. I haven't tried either. So my flow is wake up in the morning, probably around nine, start doing writing or cost or, or admin then i'll post on linkedin stay there for two hours engaging <laughs> <laughs> hi thanks for liking my post uh whatever uh, it's like let's, proper like let's meme ex over let's the laptop. exchange synergies <laughs> i'll drop some memes on your comments and that just builds so much connection though like you hmm. like like that's why we connected it, it was fun you, i you need to do vibes. more of that yeah, you do. Uh, no, I do. Yeah, you don't. You kind of post and go, so it's lucky. You can comment on my post, though. So. Yeah, I do. But uh, all right, okay. Let, let I, let's ask a question on that. So, what would you give me ten minutes to drill down? What am I doing wrong? What would I do better? <laughs> At least um, you have my phone. No, she's gone. Right there. Oh, I do. Show my phone. Do I have Wi-Fi? All right, we're gonna do a live breakdown. Live breakdown of Darren's LinkedIn content. Yeah, you're gonna give me. You're gonna basically look at. You're going to give me a full breakdown of how much of a dumbass I am. I mean, you post every day nearly, right? I post every day, dude. Yeah, yeah. Okay, this is not loading. It might load slowly. All right. Do your worst. Mm. Is this your phone? Okay. So something that I've noticed with your content is like, it's not gonna, it's not working. What I've noticed is like, you're not telling enough stories. You're just promoting the podcast and you're creating mm. educational content a lot, but it's, there's no real reason yet for someone to be interested in you. You have amazing guests and everything that you can use as authority, but the authority is you at the end. Mm. What I think I'm, I was listening, I think I, I told you to write a post, like a, a story about how you started or what's happening. You did write it. More of that is more about your transformation. Content should have two things, a transformation and the struggle. So how, what, where are you and how did you get there? Mm -hmm. Consistently, then educating them on stuff. That's what's missing. Your content is super educational and I love it. You've got the cool photos from this podcast, et cetera. But the thing that's missing is the connection part. Mm. How are you the same as that person wanting to start a podcast? And obviously the engagement bit, which you don't do. <laughs> enough uh. well tell me that because like that's a it's an interesting approach right so like you put out you put aside time to go on to how do you how do you decide who you're going to engage with i think you just go by intuition at the start you can go on and make 10 lists of like 10 top of from 10 top people that you want to be aligned with 10 top people that you think you're more likely to like you have maybe one close connection maybe you were friends at school then from there you just start building a network of your dreams it's like it just becomes intuitive but you just have to start by mm. commenting on one thing then the other one then the other one the beautiful thing about commenting is that most of my comments turn into posts if i spend five minutes on a comment i know that that can be repurposed on the post what i did at the start like six months ago was i was writing 
long comments, like three, four sentences long, I will test them. People would like them, they would turn into content. Mm. Yasmin does this as well. One of his posts, one of his comments got 500 likes the other day. He's turned it into a post. So mm. it is more about how much are you able to give yourself the chance to be seen in a good light. You do that by commenting. You don't do it just by posting content. That's just one chance. Mm -hmm. You have another hundred every single day to show up in front of your ideal audience by saying something smart, by saying something funny, by saying something relatable. For sure, for sure. I think in my instance, I don't know. I think like personally, it could be like Irish just culture. I kind of struggled telling my story just from like an open like perspective, you know, just like being open, right? Mm -hmm. But then from you and, and from many other people, I've learned to document that process a bit more and through learning storytelling frameworks, I kind of pick a moment in time and go deep in a moment in time. And then when I write the content that I write that, as you mentioned, is like educational based, I'm wrapping kind of miniature stories in there, but it's not, so it's educational content first, story second, but it should be the inverse. Yeah. Stories convert the most followers. Uh, we've seen it with data for us, especially as personal brands, mm -hmm. where you're connecting first, education second. Every single every single post that I write follows this exact same framework, is a slay framework. Story, lesson, actionable piece of advice, and a PS or a you, and it's the slay. And we we I have 40 year old men on LinkedIn saying slay, and it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Gen C's unite. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny some like bald accountant dude is like slay he's like <laughs> she's slay and i'm like hell yeah <laughs> but that look at that reaction that you just have you're laughing yeah that's the exact reaction you want everybody to have about your content you mm. want to make them feel something because <laughs> the opposite of love isn't hate it's apathy so mm. if your if your audience is reading your content they're like oh, you're wasting your time how can you make them laugh how can you make them angry how can you make them curious what is it i think the challenge that i have there is is telling the story but then disconnecting can, then connecting it to something educational because yeah this is such an element of cope but like i think that's the challenge that i have is like how do i bind that then not just being a virtue signaling look at me approach because and i have all those stories it's a humble brag it's not virtual signaling yeah. unless you make it virtual signaling. Like, I just need to scope that out in terms of like... You just need to sit down and be like, what is the actual piece of value that I can give to someone? Like I can show off my win and then tell them exactly how I got there. That's the framework. Yeah, and, and you probably may have seen that, how I've been kind of telling the US trip more, how I've been portraying that more, we've been actively working on You're that. You're doing it well in your stories. Yeah, that's been beaten into me by my wife over there. She's been... She's hitting me over the head with this because her content for storytelling is like, that's, it's all baked into, you know, really? it's faceless. I can show you later, but it's basically, it's all based on storytelling. However, and I've been bringing that into LinkedIn a bit more, but it's, it's just volume, right? It's just maybe trialing, trying an error of that process of leading with story first. And then, yeah, on the back end, actually, I know a reason why, ha, huh. you're going to criticize me on this. So. I write my newsletter mm -hmm. and then I turn the newsletter into LinkedIn posts. The Danko approach. Yeah, it's just efficiency. So I'll give an example. Let's say it is like something basic. Five steps as to why like your podcast is failing. That's in this, that's a newsletter. And then that's a long copy. And then the five points in there, then one could be like production value. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then on production value, I would say like stop recording on Zoom. You're a loser. Get into a studio. Okay. And then I would get that and then I'd obviously elaborate on another day and add a bit more. I'm only keeping that for face value, but I should be now from our conversation is adding in like, okay, like this is what I'm doing in Miami. This is the actual gap. This is the difference. This is how like Lara's enjoyed it more. She's brought her mom. We can't bring her mom on Zoom. <laughs> you know, that's kind of adding in the story element, but I would spend Saturday writing and Sunday editing generally. Yeah. But that's how, that's why, where my content comes from, by the way. So that's why it's very educational based. I think the... You can rip me, go on. I think repurposing is too overly glamorized in the content space. Because you can't just repurpose stuff. The only person that does it very well is Danko and Justin Welsh, but they, they're two industry titans out of everyone else and they've got decades that probably of content. The 
normal person trying to grow a personal brand right now in 2025 can't just repurpose. You need to recreate what you're talking about before. So most of my content is repurposed from Twitter, but I have a different angle. Every social media has a different culture. Newsletter, they're subscribed to you specifically. On LinkedIn, they're not subscribed to you. They're following you. They're not subscribed to just you. So how can you actually hook them in with something that you wrote on your newsletter? Well, you change the angle. You add curiosity. You add polarization. You add FOMO. Um, instead of saying, I'm in Miami for the next two weeks, I'm, I'm so excited. I am Miami, living my dream life with my wife, getting dream guests involved. Here's how I did it. That's a lot more powerful than just stating the fact how, how you would on, on your newsletter. Then on Twitter, it's smaller. So you'd be like, just landed in Miami. Here's what I'm doing and four photos. So it is not just repurposing, it's having a different angle and reiterating what you already wrote in a different way to attract that different audience. Mm -hmm. LinkedIn audience is usually coldish because they either don't know you, they, they haven't found you. Newsletter, they care about you. They're so involved in you. They know what you're doing. They read you every day. They have you straight into your newsletter. So for me, repurposing doesn't work unless mm -hmm. you have an eye for it. And the eye comes from having a good hook, having a structure for it, um, being able to understand, is this actually immediately applicable for my audience? Can they actually relate to the story and then apply it? Mm. It is it is not as easy as as people think, and hence why the majority of people are failing at creating content on multi multi platforms. I didn't create content on Twitter until I hit thirty k. I didn't grow a newsletter until I hit fifty k. I didn't uh, start on YouTube until I hit eighty k. Why? Because it was mastery of each platform first, and mm. then on to the next by understanding the culture of it. Because it's inverse for podcasting, right? Mm. You start with... With long? You start, Yeah, well, you start with long and then you have to bring it into short. Well, not have to, but if the content isn't performing well enough, that's your second angle. It's a second, it's reviving, mm -hmm. basically. So that's what I've taken in the newsletter, but it's such a good point. So my question for you on that is, do you write fresh every day? Like fresh idea? Yes and no. So Twitter has been my testing ground for the last year. So I will just ship posts on Twitter. And then every single week, I'll look at my stats and see like what, what we did the best. I'll repurpose the idea onto LinkedIn. So I'll take the screenshot from Twitter onto LinkedIn, but add a completely different view on the copy on top. So the content is never the same. It's always mm -hmm. two different angles and it acts as two different hooks. The photo is a hook, the content is a hook. Now turn onto YouTube content. Now both hooks worked, which one was the, which, which one is the easiest entry point for someone? People like easy mm -hmm. um, and simple. So how can I get them the quickest win? then turn that into a YouTube script. And then newsletters, I just freestyle. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? I just freestyle. Like, I'll be like, what am I feeling like talking about this week? And it's just intimate stories, et cetera. Interesting. So from- It's probably, it's a very inefficient process. I wouldn't recommend uh, if you're not chronically online or addicted to your phone. But it's also effective, right? Because- Yes. Like, that's why the artist's work seems illogical. It seems inefficient. It's but a thing it's that doesn't scale. Like I, it's impossible. I couldn't hire a writer to do the thing that I do. <laughs> my tone of voice is very unique, and I really shot myself in the foot right there. But at the same time, I built an audience that's really engaged with me. The other day, mm. uh, someone made an inside joke about something I said like five months ago in an email, just as a throwaway comment. They remember that. They like mm. it. They want to be involved in the journey, the story, the, your little quirks. I hate mm. voice notes. People remember that. They're like. Yeah, sorry, I'm going to send you a voice note. <laughs> I'm like, hey. I always send you voice notes. I'm no, but it's okay. I, I like voice notes from my friends, not strangers. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Um, but I have a really interesting stat. One of my newsletters, this launch, made us about $10,000. I tested every single approach, every single angle for my, um, for my launch. I did social proof, testimonials, facts, FOMO, like all the case studies, mm. um, information first, and stories. Guess, guess which one converted the most? Stories. Yes. And it was a super story. The hook was like, I dropped 260 pounds on my foot. <laughs> what? <laughs> and then the subtitle was like, this is the reason why I never take my socks off. Explain. I was posting <laughs> case studies these people, these people are getting millions of impressions. Here's how you could do it too, blah, blah, blah. Crickets. Okay, cool. <laughs> Weight story on my foot. Yeah, sick. Why? <laughs> it was weird. 
it was mm. interesting. Again, you're laughing and it's just providing that experience to someone is the most unique and incredible thing you could do. Because if you're entertaining someone via email, imagine how much you can give them. Again, people want to feel. Mm. They want to feel again. They want connection. They want community. They want electrifying stuff. And then if I provide them with a funny fact that it's not just salesy, but it's entertaining, then they'll, they'll, <laughs> they'll buy into it. What it was, was the story? So I, <laughs> I painted the story of uh, me being in a power, powerlifting competition. I opened the email with, it's, I mean, I'm about to hit the stage and the ref calls my name. I'm about to hit my last deadlift for um, getting into internationals or whatever it was. And I was trying to lift 120 kilos and I was shaking. I was nervous. I lifted the way up. I lifted the way up for what it felt like two hours. And then I got the lift. But what people didn't see is that I dropped the 120 kilos on one of my foot, one of my uh, my big foot and pinky. Did I care? Fuck no. Because mm. I wanted to win and I would have done anything for it. And then I reshaped it into this is why you have to have the hunger to win. Mm. And then I went into the sale, which was mm. I was painting the image of how much work you have to do to build a parcel run with the story of hard work and being obsessed. And I was like, by this point, you guys know I'm insane. <laughs> like, you guys know it. We've seen it. You have to be insane to to win. Every mm. single person that I know that is successful has a hint of crazy in them because it's what drives us. And you have to hardwire yourself to win. Mm. You have to hardwire yourself to love the hard things. I when, I when that piece of weight, like the weight fell into my foot, I felt happy because I was like fuck yeah I did it <laughs> shit formed land on your foot <laughs> I did it but I did it I qualified Gross. I got to the next level and that's all I want and I would do it would would do it all over again and then mm. I think the having interesting things to say it, it will make you the most interesting person in the room they'll choose you above anyone else that's making maybe making more than you maybe more experience than you because you're funny or you're relative relatable and interesting mm. Look, look at the majority of courses, they're, fil they're, they're, they're filmed on Loom or like Tala or stuff. People want more quality. Your podcast, when you do it at home, you've got the setup, you've got the lights. I'm like, he's got such good quality. They want that. Mm. People are tired of average. They want better. And that's why in a world of mediocrity, people genuinely appreciate someone who's just obsessed. Right? Yeah. And that's why Zach Pogreb, like he's literally called Obsession Love dude, him. Right? But genuinely, like he's done so much different evolutions of his life. But he's just obsessed. And then people are like, oh, cool. I'm going to follow you. Yeah. <laughs> it's as simple. It's literally as simple as that. Everybody wants to be obsessed, but no one wants, no, no one does what it takes to be obsessed. Such a good point to finish on. This was awesome.